So hello everybody, I'm Gita Yadav and I will talk today about how I teach R to life scientists. We've had a wonderful talk by Luke just now. I'm a lecturer and a plant scientist and uh, I work at the interface of India and the United Kingdom, Cambridge mainly. And we're doing a lot of data science, biodiversity informatics mostly. But, you know, more than half of my, or at least half of my, my uh, task is to be able to train students. And uh, I will be talking therefore about, so for the past 10 years, almost 15 years, I have been teaching different things in computational biology. And over the past two years of the pandemic, we have moved online with our short format series. And that is how I connected with Jason and uh, got into this group where I think it's incredible to hear about other short format trainers and the kind of things you all teach formally. So this is all informal things that I do on weekends or in between by connecting with other groups and other trainers. You know, we always share each other's courses and meet with each other and, uh, you know, help out each other. But formally, as a part of the University of, Bio University of Cambridge Bioinformatics Training Facility, we are teaching a lot of courses um, in R, which are, and not just in R, we do other kinds of programming. As one of the speakers was, uh, was talking today, we teach Python, we teach Perl, we teach Unix. But R is the core center of different kinds of things we're teaching from basic stuff, basic programming all the way to, you know, statistics, high-end genomics, RNA-seq, ChIP-seq, ATAC-seq, and uh, more recently, a lot of biological network analyses in R. <clears throat> the most important part of what I feel, uh, you know, is, um, you know, should be um, about being a trainer is to be able to connect with the world and publicize the kind of work you want to. So your course has to become available and accessible to others. And therefore we have this calendar where people can just take a look at what different things we do and how they're happening. And so we have dates and you can move forwards and backwards with previous courses. You like a previous course, you can write to us and we'll try to come up with another version of that course or run it again and so on. When you click on one of these courses on the website of the University of Cambridge Bioinformatics Training Facility, you will find that great. So the part one was course publicity. I'm going back to it. And the first part was to make your course accessible and available to others so that people know what you're trying to teach. And so when you click on one of these courses, you go into the uh, details for that course. For example, now, of course, during the pandemic, we have moved online. So all of these are online live trainings. And Luke mentioned one very important thing. The reason why people come and take these courses with us is not for the content. It is for the live training and the handholding that we provide, which I think as trainers really makes all the difference in the world. So essentially this, uh, you know, our calendar will have information on what that course is, what is going to be taught, or, you know, whether you can make a booking, whether it's full or do you have places, do you want to get into the wait list and so on. And then you will have an idea about how that course runs. The short format could be a few hours in a day or a few hours every day consecutively or on Mondays, Fridays and so on. So this is an example where over several <clears throat> years of running the basic R course, we realized that if we give a gap between, uh, you know, gap of the weekend in between it helps the participants to absorb what we taught them on the first two days and then come back to us with the more interesting questions later and we also have as you will note over here among trainers you always have a lead trainer so here you'll see my name as the lead trainer but we have helpers with us so these are also co-trainers and experts in the same subject in R, for example now who are going to be literally helping you with the training because the lead trainer often you know if i'm talking to you and i'm my i'm being recorded and if you get stuck somewhere it's if i stop to handle your query then the other 20 or 30 or 40 people in the class will also get left behind so what we do is every once in a while we have we wait for everybody to come to come up to you know the same space but in more general uh, during the course the helpers are there who are going to take you out into a breakout room fix your problem bring you back up to speed with the course and put you right back into the main course and so on so our helpers are far more important than the main um, you know instructor who's the lead instructor and so on so the second part of leading a course like this especially online and of course teaching coding to life scientists is about keeping the course materials very very clear and i think most of you as trainers would already real uh, understand where i'm going to what we do is we <coughs> we provide individual logins and password to every participant before the course and therefore we can't really afford to have a lot of participants on each course and uh, this is critical because we want to avoid device installations and the 
kind of glitches we've had when we've had students bring their own laptops or computers to a course, even pre-pandemic in the olden days, was like somebody's got a Windows, it's a Windows 8, 7, 10. And as, as Andrew was saying, it could be a completely, if you don't have X code, you don't have 50 other things. And it didn't occur to me because as an instructor, I haven't even thought about the fact that you may not have basic, uh, you know, the R Studio installed. Uh, leave alone issues such as, do you have the same data as me, which I'm going to be teaching you on? Do you have the same settings and packages as myself and so on? So therefore, we overcome all of those glitches by offering individual logins and passwords to the entire course uh, course or to the entire device. So basically we've cloned all of our data settings, tools and softwares and we provide it to you. So you just should have access to the internet. The rest will be through the internet. So it's entirely online. And it also allows me to uh, assign homework to participants and check the work online without having to bother about what device they're using and what uh, version or state of disarray it is in. The second thing that we always have is a shared main document. It's very much like the Google document that Jason has shared for this, uh, for the for these events that we have every month. And in this shared main document, we would have the link because you often lo lose students lose uh, links to the online Zoom or they get glitched out, they get chucked out, they have to come back in. And searching for your inbox and that particular email can take hours. And so therefore we have a shared main document. The shared main document, I will try and show you um, how the shared main document looks, but it has all you know, everything from reading material, question and answers, introductions to participants, feedback form links, and so on. So everything is in one place, which allows us as trainers and the students as participants to all stick on to that one. And that single main document is shared with the group or with the participants at least a week beforehand so that they start telling us their introductions. And on the main day, we don't waste time in, uh, you know, really uh, with 40 people, it could take a long time to introduce yourself. So then each person can take a look at the intro links and so on. And of course, live help, as I said, is the critical most part of the whole course. So this is the main document where we would have the timetable, as you can see, but we would also tell you how to uh, prepare the R environment or the VLE for this course. And so all participants will receive access to a remote R environment that has already been set up with all the requirements for this course, and it has been tested to be working properly. Right. So that will be individual to each person. And we recommend that our participants use this environment rather than their own laptop R versions, you know, to avoid losing any teaching time, as well as to avoid losing or, or having new technical issues. And of course, we have links to the Zoom itself. The course notes has a website. So all of the courses are online and the website is online. So you can follow on day one, day two or morning session and afternoon session and the exercises and the answers to exercises and so on. And of course, participant introductions and feedback surveys are all right there in this document. Further on, we also have reading and uh, actions and other courses that you might want to be, you know, you might show your interest in, be want to be part of and so on. Everything is um, there in the same main document. The live course delivery itself takes place over two parallel um, you know, two parallel mechanisms in which one is this kind of a Zoom session. So I'm the, I'm the speaker right now and I'm speaking to all of you. You're listening to me, but I also am typing out my code. So I'm, you're not just seeing my presentation where well, you are, but in between we will switch back and forth between. So I will usually have a dual monitor with me. On one, I have my presentation. On the other monitor, I have my R window or my R studio where I will be typing out code, which you can see. The participants also need to have two devices usually. I mean, in the best case scenario, I can't, I shouldn't expect everybody to have two devices, but it helps because on one device, you're basically seeing on one screen, you see what, you see what your trainer is teaching you and what code I'm typing. And on the other screen, you can actually do it yourself. So DIY, dipping your fingers, at least with coding, and listen until you try it yourself, you really don't absorb what's going on and don't realize what can go wrong particularly. So we do this live course delivery over many different things. So the kind of R Studio logins we provide are either through the cloud or Amazon Web Services or the internal dockers that, I, um, uh, that are within our servers. We create these dockers and then give it to every single participant. I found personally, I found the R cloud to be most convenient because you, you can get started for free. And during the course, if it's a you know, two week course, you just um, you know, buy the classroom space for two weeks and then you can make your own project. So I've made a, you know, I, if I have a four day course, I'll have a 
separate our studio um, environment for each day. Here you see the day one. And I'm the owner of this, but 18 derived projects. So each one of my 18 participants were ab was able to derive the same project. So they would have the same scripts, the same subfolders, the same working directory, which is usually the biggest glitch. The students don't immediately understand the concept of a working directory. And they put subfolders in different places, but we provide them a pre preset system of uh, you know working directories and so on so that works and then I have a day two day three day four and there I can assign each one of them as an assignment and check each one of these 22 projects the 22 people cannot see each other's screens but I as a teacher or an instructor have access to each one of these derived projects or each one of the students and I can always like this happened this course happened in July sometime but I still have access to all the 22 and the students have it too you could always delete them move about uh, and export them but the best thing is to keep them there because you can then run the same course again with the same data and let a new set of students derive these uh, these these uh, uh, you know structures and the whole package works consistently and if you click on any one like this is day three when you go into day three you see that i start with the day two session recap that's my same script in addition i have uh, the data the patient so this was about covid patients and we were trying to teach them what to do how to model data on covid patients and so on so everything is right there you could run the whole script and students will also have access to this and so on okay the uh, second to last part is about add-ons. So other than the main presentations and lectures that we're giving and the course delivery that's happening, what else can become useful in such, an, in such a scenario where we are, we are offering the course online? <clears throat> First is you need to have an internal Slack channel of the instructors because you can't do this chatting on the chat box of Zoom. Everyone's watching the chat box of Zoom and it's not a webinar Zoom, it's a regular Zoom, right? So you want the students and to be able to handle things there, but at your end, you need to know what went wrong. And sometimes you can see the kind of conversations we've had here. You don't remember when to stop the recording or pause it or to continue it. And then sometimes we find, uh, you know, we try to tell each other, if I'm finding you going too fast, I can tell you on the Slack, Gita, think about slowing down a bit and so on. And that, you know, reading that Slack channel gives me an internal idea about how I'm doing as a, and sometimes the questions are crazy. So we tell each other, I can't handle this question. Somebody else handle it. And then they do and so on. And we handle breakouts with each other. You can see I've got at least seven to 10 different Slack channels for each course. So we built these Slack channels for, for the instructors for each course to just chat with each other so that we are not, um, you know, so that we don't appear to be, talking on the Zoom where the students are. And this is, this is quite critical. Then, of course, we have to provide the, you know, we think about course structures. We provide information about what kind of prerequisites every course has, what kind of attendees we can have. And the short format situation is the best. Usually, I think that a combination of lectures and hands on work practicals is the best, but on day one, you should always have some mechanism of ice breaking, particularly in an online course. And we do it usually by quizzes through Menti, but there can be other kind. I'm open to ideas that you all have come up with to, to ice break because the worst thing about the online mechanism of delivering a course is you don't see the faces of other people and you might, you know, you don't know if they're there, if they've gone to sleep, if they're still, you know, it's not a classroom. And so we have to come up with newer and newer ways of ice breaking. And of course, Alison Horst is our savior for everything that you want to ever tell anybody about how to do R and talk about ourselves as our trainers and learners. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> so that's about it. And I've never been able to teach factors so well since, you know, the, the, since Alison Horst's categorical variables came along. <coughs> Couple of other things. Feedback, that's the last part. We look at surveys. Slack channels, Twitter, media posts, and so on. Thank you.